And now we're going to go into our next session, and I want to say a couple words about it. Alice Rivlin, who is a senior fellow for economic studies at Center for Health Policy at Brookings, of course, she was former director of the Office of Management and Budget, vice chair of the Federal Reserve. Uh, she is a member of the board of the Center for the Res a Responsible Federal Budget. Many of you know Maya McGinnis's work. And Alice, um, each year, uh, has come uh, to, this, to this forum to talk to us about fiscal responsibility. The title of this session is, Are We Violating Our Fiscal Responsibility? I'm going to retitle it and say, Is Violating Our Fiscal Responsibility um, ever, ever uh, an issue? Uh, in other words, we seem to keep doing it. If you were to look at the correlation of the eight editions of Summit on the Economy and where our long-term debt is, you would want to blame us uh, uh, somewhat for that. So it's gone that one direction. But um, to have a very interesting conversation, and I think uh, I should add that the CBO just finally came out and redid its score um, on the overall budget and uh, uh, tax impacts that we've seen recently and added a trillion and a half dollars more to our long-term debt. So we'll start off with that optimistic um, data point. And interviewing her is Craig Gordon, uh, my very good friend, Washington Bureau Chief of Bloomberg News here in Washington. It's not a party unless Craig is there. So without further ado, Craig Gordon and Alice Rivlin. Thank you, sir. Get in there. Okay, good. All right, well, thank you all for coming. As Steve said, I am Craig Gordon, uh, the Washington Bureau Chief of Bloomberg News, and obviously you all know my guest here, Dr. Alice Rivlin, who needs very, very little introduction and what little she needed, Steve just did. So I'm going to get right sure. into the first question. Um, the title, as Steve said, is this is really a, a panel about are we violating our fiscal responsibility, but I would actually like to turn that question uh, upside down a little bit and remind everyone in this room of uh, what they know. It's the second longest economic expansion in history, nine years and counting. Uh, we are effectively at full unemployment. Unemployment is one of the lowest rates, sustained rates for the past 50 years. The economy could hit 5% growth in the second quarter, which would be the highest in more than a decade. And of course, there are some economists who think we could hit that 3% annual growth number that Donald Trump talked about when he said, if you pass my tax cuts, I will get you 3% economic growth. I know I was among the people who scoffed at that, but that could <laughs> actually come true. So why worry? What's the worry? I don't think too many people outside this room uh, with an economy that I just described are terribly worried about fiscal responsibility now. Why are we worried about it at all? Well, I agree with you. I don't see any reason why we should worry about the next few months. Uh, even the next uh, couple of years look, uh, look really good. But we can't go on living beyond our means. Uh, it's certainly true that if you take your credit card out and say, I'm just going to spend up to the, the limit, it uh, doesn't matter, uh, these bills will never come due, <laughs> I won't have to pay interest on them, that uh, uh, you can feel pretty good for a while. And basically, that's what our country is doing. And I don't think the fiscal policy is the only point at which we're being irresponsible about the future. We're not thinking about long run, the long run health of the economy very much at all. We aren't dealing with climate change. We aren't dealing with how you get higher growth. We ought to be investing in infrastructure. We ought to be investing more uh, in skills and science and a lot of things that you need for future growth. So we don't care about the future. We only care about the short run. Mm -hmm. So what happens in, what, what is your time horizon for when these bills come due and the trouble really starts? Well, that's the problem. A, nobody knows. We have a very good credit record as a country. The world thinks of us as a strong economy, because we are, mm -hmm. uh, and one that pays its bills. We're not Greece. Uh, we are the United States of America. We honor our obligations. We always have. We've gotten that point across uh, to uh, investors around the world. Uh, so we can borrow about as much as we want at very low interest rates. And uh, one data point that I think is interesting, well, I was in the beginning of the Clinton administration when we were very worried about fiscal responsibility. Now, why in the world were we so worried about it? The <laughs> debt was much smaller. Uh, even the deficit was much smaller. 
uh, why did a Democratic president decide uh, that he ought to give high priority to reducing the deficit? Uh, and the answer is interest rates. We were genuinely worried uh, that the debt service on this debt, which was then something like 14% uh -huh. of the budget, now it's six and a half uh -huh. uh, on a much bigger debt, uh, but we were worried that the debt service was going to mount so rapidly uh, that we couldn't do all the other things that uh, democratic administrations always, always want to do. Uh, so it seemed really important uh, to get that deficit down. And we did it, not all by ourselves. It was uh, uh, cooperation with Republicans, but uh, it did happen. We had a surplus by the end of the decade. So why haven't presidents since then, including Obama or Trump certainly today, you, were, you felt a real world worry that if you spent all the money on paying for the debt, you wouldn't have any money to do the fun stuff that I'm sure Bill Clinton wanted to do in terms of the economy. In fact, we know right now we're paying $316 billion a year on debt service. We're looking at almost a trillion by 2028. So it is money that is actually gonna have to come out of somewhere. Why do you think other presidents haven't been as uh, thoughtful about it or responsible about it? Well, there have been different uh, reasons. I think um, George W. Bush, because he really wanted to do some, uh, some spending things like uh, adding uh, prescription drugs to Medicare, right. mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, we thought of in the Clinton administration. <laughs> it wasn't exactly a new idea, uh, but we didn't think we could afford it because it would t put too much pressure on the debt. Uh, and so we didn't do a lot of those kinds of things uh, that, uh, that George Bush did, and then of course he had two wars and, and uh, other, other things. He wasn't terribly concerned uh, about fiscal responsibility, although uh, it wasn't, uh, the deficits at that time weren't terribly high. Right. It was just that he wasn't thinking ahead, right. and none of us have been thinking ahead. Right. It's not that we didn't know about the baby boom generation. <laughs> They've been around for quite a while. Uh, and now they're uh, hitting the uh, Medicare and uh, uh, Social Security roles, and it's expensive, and we're not prepared to pay for that, so we're borrowing uh, to do it. Obama was in a different situation. Uh, Obama, unfortunately, uh, came after the crash. Uh, he was bailing the boat as fast as he could. I mean, there was nothing to be done except uh, try to turn around this disastrous recession uh, and get back to normal, and it happened. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, right. But he had to throw a lot of money at it. To he had to throw. Right. A, well, he had to throw a lot of money at it, but that wasn't the main reason that the debt went up. Debt goes up when you have a deep recession automatically. Mm -hmm. Economists call that automatic stabilizers. And it's a good thing. I mean, people pay less taxes because they're earning less money. And some expenditures go up, like unemployment compensation. So you have an automatic big increase uh, in the deficit and the debt. Uh, that happened without Obama doing anything. And on top of that, we had the stimulus, which helped get us out of it. Sure. Um, to, to play devil's advocate for a second, Jay Powell, the Fed chairman, just at his June press conference, actually seemed open to the idea that these tax cuts and some of the other things that are included in the tax bill, like the immediate expensing of capital infrastructure, could sort of juice the economy enough to make this insustainability, unsustainability question a little less important. I mean, he said basically, it makes sense, is quoting Jay Powell, it makes sense that if you lower corporate tax rates and allow faster expensing of investment, you will encourage greater investment, that should drive productivity, and that should increase potential output. He seems to suggest at least the, the committee is open to the argument that these will be a real good supply side uh, jolt and uh, keep things rolling along. Well, the thing is, how fast and how long? Okay. Uh, I mean, it's certainly true uh, that you can juice the economy with a tax cut, uh, almost any kind of a tax cut, but uh, uh, one that favors corporate investment, uh, if this one does, maybe it just for favors uh, buyback of stock, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it, it, to the extent that it favors corporate investment, uh, that's a good thing. 
uh, mostly corporations invest because they see a market there, uh, not because of tax policy, mm -hmm. but be that as it may, uh, you can certainly juice the economy with a tax cut, and we've done it. Uh, but um, if you look ahead, uh, there's some daunting things in the way of growing faster. Uh, one of them is that our labor force mm -hmm. will grow very slowly right. because we're all getting older. I, not uh, me, but that's, <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> You've heard about that. <laughs> uh, even you. <laughs> and uh, uh, so an, uh, a, a slow growth in the labor force means slower growth in the economy unless that labor force is a lot more productive. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, productivity growth has been slow. Now, maybe we can do some things to uh, rev up our productivity growth. I hope we can. Uh, I think some of them that we ought to be doing are the ones I mentioned. They're the public sector things. Okay. Let's fix our infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, invest uh, in science and technology, and let's invest heavily in skills of the future workforce. Yeah. Uh, that's really important, so is corporate investment. But even if you do all of those things, nobody thinks you can grow the economy fast enough uh, to uh, get uh, this debt coming down. Uh, we're going to have to uh, reduce the long-run uh, spending of the government, uh, reduce the rate of growth of it. You're not gonna reduce it. You're not right, gonna right. reduce the rate of growth right. of it, uh, which is mostly healthcare spending. And that's hard to manage, uh, and or, I think and, we're going to have to raise taxes. So that was my, leads very nicely into my next question, which is in, uh, we're gonna have a presidential election in just two years, someone from your party will be running, I assume, uh, to try to beat Donald I Trump. I hope so. <laughs> That'd be nice, right? And uh, <coughs> what is the advice you would give them about how to begin to solve this problem? Because most of the solutions are pretty unpleasant. It's raising taxes, it's cutting government spending, it's a variety of things like that that we all know. I'm, I'm old enough to remember, even though I'm quite young, Walter Mondale saying, you know, both of us are gonna raise your taxes, he won't tell you I just did. I recall he lost 49 states. Yes, so, that may not have been the only reason, but he did. Didn't help. Um, I, it didn't help. So as we head into this, this next you know, presidential fight, and these questions are all looming, what is the advice, what is the prescription you would offer a Democratic candidate who came to you for advice of how to fix this problem? First, I don't want to just talk to the Democratic candidate. I'd Fair. like to talk to both candidates. Okay. Uh, because I think the only way we're going to get a serious reduction in the rate of growth of debt is through a bipartisan agreement. Because as you say, uh, whatever you do is gonna hurt uh, in the short run to get uh, a longer run uh, solution. That's true of a lot of problems. Yeah. Uh, and um, the biggest problem we have at the moment is that the two parties are not working together to solve long run problems uh, at all. Uh, they're very focused on the st short run, both of them, uh, and on the blame game. Uh, most of what you hear from politicians these days on both sides is, it's his fault, no, it's his fault. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, you know, that's like children squabbling. And uh, we've got to get away from the blame game and say, look, we've got some problems here. Let's get together and figure out how to solve them. And that's going to take a negotiation uh, in which not everybody gets uh, what they want. Mm -hmm. I read the politics uh, going forward, and a lot of political scientists do too, uh, as the we're going to have a lot of party switching. Uh, we're a divided country, and we get very impatient with whoever's in power. Uh, they didn't fix it all, so let's vote for the other guy. Right. And that's partly how uh, Donald Trump won. Uh, they didn't fix it, I will. Uh, and we tend to believe people like that. We kind of buy it, don't we? <laughs> we, right? we buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if uh, we are in this situation, and there's a whole group of voters who are not very strongly attached to either party. Some of them are independents, some of them are registered Democrats or Republicans, but they could switch. 
Uh, and those people switch back and forth. So if you have uh, an unstable situation like that, then if you're going to solve any problem, you've got to get together. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if you, one party takes all the action, uh, as in the Affordable Care Act, as in the recent tax bill, right. then the other side, side is going to say, uh, that's terrible. Uh, they're awful people, uh, we could do it better, uh, and that's not the way you're going to solve any problem, mm -hmm. certainly not a serious fiscal problem. So unless the two parties can get together and say, here's what we'd like to do to fix the long-run debt, or to improve health care, or to deal with climate change, uh, what do you want to do? And they cut some kind of a deal, mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a total solution. <laughs> it's a, a grand of, bargain. You always <laughs> a lucid and, grand bargain, right? Well, there's, a, there's always a lucid grand bargain. But po uh, policy isn't like that. You don't come to a grand bargain, solve the problem, and go home. Uh, you have to make policy, see how it's working, adjust it, uh, and uh, go from there. These things are complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I am a big believer in bipartisanship these days, and I think it especially applies uh, to fiscal policy. Uh, I'm going to open up for questions. We're going to have about five minutes for questions at the end, but I want to ask one other question that's ripped from the headlines today. Donald Trump just announced another list of $200 billion in products, uh, Chinese products that he's planning to impose tariffs on. The Chinese have already said they'll retaliate. The retaliation is a little trickier because there aren't $200 billion of American products they can slap a tariff on. They have to get, get a little more creative. What economic impact do you see from those tariffs, short-term, medium-term, long-term? I don't think the direct impact of uh, the tariffs announced so far will be huge. I mean, we're a really big economy and uh, uh, we're uh, going gangbusters at the, at the moment. Some people will be hurt, the people who buy the things. Uh, rather than make them. Uh, but uh, I don't think we'll have a huge uh, economic impact in the short run. Uh, but a trade war is a stupid thing to do, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> don't sugarcoat it, Alice. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> we don't want to be in trade wars, especially not with our allies and people that we need to help us uh, with other uh, problems. Now, that doesn't minimize our problems with China. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we need uh, to get more access to their markets and stop some of the bad things they're doing on intellectual property. Uh, but I don't think this is the way to do it. Right, understood. Uh, we have some microphones floating around in the audience. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Rivlin, uh, we'd be happy to take them. And I see one right there. Thank you. This has been a great discussion. If I can, I'd like to link it back to our previous discussion on trade and ask you, how can we possibly have a balanced trade policy, much less run a trade surplus, if we're borrowing a trillion dollars internationally? Good question. Really good question. Yeah. Really good question. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we used to talk about the twin deficits. Uh, and they aren't exactly uh, twins. Uh, but uh, borrowing a lot of money means you're not saving. You're doing the opposite. Uh, and our large uh, fiscal deficit is a subtraction from our national saving. Uh, and what we really have to do is get our national savings up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will uh, redound to our credit uh, on the trade front uh, as well. So they are linked in, in that They are definitely mm -hmm. uh, linked, and uh, uh, we shouldn't imagine that we can uh, run uh, trade surpluses uh, and uh, still borrow a lot of money. You borrow a lot of money. Uh, good. Any other questions out there? Uh, I just see a hand somewhere. Go for it. There's one right here. Uh, and one yeah. here, I see. Or shall. Thank you. 
There you go. So again, linking it to the last panel, uh, we heard that Ken and Fikri with the Economic Innovation Group, I probably wasn't supposed to get the mic, uh, but uh, so we heard from the last panel that uh, the um, you know, support for trade uh, usually swings with the support for, or free trade agreements at least, with support for the party in power. Do we see something similar with fiscal responsibility? Uh, are the Democrats about to become the party of fiscal responsibility, or is it something that just the opposition uh, kind of starts to, uh, starts to care about? Remarkably good question. The, the out party is always the party of fiscal responsibility. <laughs> Doesn't matter who it is. Uh, it's a lot easier when you don't actually have to do it, the, right? Yeah. The <laughs> Republicans uh, roasted Obama to a fairly well for deficits he couldn't possibly have controlled. Uh, we were in a recession, folks. Uh, and uh, uh, naturally, the uh, deficit went up uh, very high, and uh, okay, you're in the art party, blame it on the in party, must be Obama's fault. Right. Uh, and uh, the Democrats do the same thing, uh, but, and that just proves my point. Uh, until we get back to bipartisan fiscal policy uh, and some kind of agreement or set of negotiations over bringing the debt under control, we're not gonna do it. It's not gonna happen. Sir. You could shout. That's a shout. That's no shouting. Um, oh. <laughs> we've got millions of people watching online right oh now, so I want them to hear you. I wasn't, Sorry, nervous, Craig. I wasn't nervous until right then, Steve. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Alejandro Becerra, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Uh, you talked about our economy uh, being comprised of an aging workforce. When Trump started his campaign, he criticized the unemployment figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics as mm -hmm. being fake. Now he takes the credit for those very same figures. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he alleged and categorized that there were 92 million people who were out of the labor force. He deemed them to be the silent generation of jobless Americans. That figure has grown to 95.5 million today. Why doesn't anybody hold him accountable for what he's done to those so-called jobless Americans? Well, <coughs> yes, I was amused at how much credit uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know. The president <laughs> takes for statistics that he was criticizing uh, only, only uh, less than two years ago. Uh, but um, that's, again, that's normal political yeah, behavior, sort of behavior except that everything Donald Trump is exaggerating normal <laughs> <laughs> political <laughs> behavior. Uh, and the BLS, to its credit, uh, has given us all the numbers you could possibly want about uh, unemployment mm -hmm. uh, or employment, uh, including uh, the fact that we do have more people out of the labor force, more prime age males out of the labor force uh, than we used to have. Uh, and this is a, this is a uh, conundrum, I think. Right. Uh, economists aren't uh, quite sure why it's true. Now, tight labor markets help. And they do seem to be helping at the moment. I mean, the last set of statistics on Friday uh, showed that the, uh, there were more people coming back into the labor force, yes. enough more, uh, so that the unemployment rate actually went up a little yeah, bit, it took uh, which was not bad news. It was the, the good news of more right. people in the, in the labor force. Uh, I don't think there's any one answer to this. Mm -hmm. uh, some people uh, have just gotten discouraged uh, because they can't find a job, mm -hmm. uh, and they may be older workers, and uh, you know, some of the things that were emphasized on the trade panel uh, are, are still true sure. in much of the country. We have, we have left uh, a lot of the middle American communities that used to depend on manufacturing uh, behind. That's not a new story, right. uh, but it's a still true story. Uh, and, uh, but there may be other reasons uh, that uh, uh, people, that if we have a really <laughs> vibrant economy and, and are able to hold it long enough, uh, we'll get more people back uh, into, into the labor force. And I think we should try it. Uh, I'm not worried about uh, 
uh, inflation at the moment. The other mystery, and it's a related mystery, uh, is why wages haven't gone up yes. more. Uh, you would expect in a labor market as tight as tight this as ours, right. that uh, wages would be rising faster than they are. Now, from an inflation point of view, that's good, but from most people point of view who yeah. earn world yeah. <laughs> earn wages it's not not good news and we got to figure that out yeah well that's wonderful thank you so much i think we have to leave it there i know there are future panels on work and the workforce uh getting folks back on the job and the changing uh, landscape there so thank you so much for your time and thank you always two two, two quick Ruben. questions um alice oh. the economy on the summit ninth annual econom economy on the summit will be uh, next july um will you join us again Sure. There wow. you go. Great. Well, you got one thing out of the way. Here first. Craig Gordon with Bloomberg. Hey, is Mike Bloomberg going to run? No comment. With that big round of applause, Craig Gordon and Alice Rivlin, thank you so, so much. much.